Thank you. Uh, I have my co-author, Jesse Parent, is in the chat, and he's going to give you a link to the slides, which are available at this link, uh, tiny URL link, and uh, you can uh, follow there. There are a couple more slides, actually, in that slide deck because I wanted to cut these down for in the interest of time. Uh, so this is epistemological directories for research, development, and education. This is our lab, and uh, Jesse and I are the authors. Uh, okay. Um, so this, this, this talk is, is going to introduce a couple of instances of this thing we're calling epistemological directories. And they come in different flavors right now. It's, it's something that we've been kind of developing in, on multiple fronts. Uh, so you'll see some varieties of that as we go along. But this is also rooted in the evolution of the web. And uh, I wanted to bring this up because I'll talk about it in the talk a little bit in terms of like what the antecedents of these directories and then the feature of these directories. So the first thing, the first part of the web was uh, Web 1.0, and that happened from sort of the beginning of the graphical web browser till about maybe the early to mid 2000s. And that involved broadcasted information and things like annotated bibliographies. So it was quite static. Uh, then we had Web 2.0, which evolved with the advent of social media platforms. So from the early 2000s on to more or less today. So we had social media, we had version control as another technology uh, that enabled things. And then we're moving towards Web 3.0, which involve uh, even more advanced technological innovations like virtual worlds and the semantic web. And so with that framework, I want you to think a little bit now about history. Uh, what is a historical milestone? And what is the relevance of a historical event? So I have these really abstract diagrams, but these are supposed to represent events in time. Uh, so these events might have qualitative significance and explain a certain amount of the unknown. So it's like some you know, innovation, as we were talking about in the last slide, or some paper or some person that did something great. Uh, and that's up to the person interpreting it. Uh, but can we do with this without subjective judgment? So can we do this in an objective way? Uh, but even if we can't, does this lead to group consensus or gatekeeping? So who's telling the history and uh, who's presenting it? So there are a lot of common themes across scholars and learners. And if you look in the uh, full slide deck, you'll see a bunch of these questions. Uh, one, the one I wanted to focus on here, though, was uh, what are the most important things we need to know in order to be competent? And so this is kind of a digression from the last slide, but you'll see how they stitch together in a minute. And so the answer to that is we can use some criterion to say this is what you need to know to be competent in some area. And so this has been addressed by the physicist Leonard Susskind, who, along with his co-author, wrote a book called The Theoretical Minimum. And so their concern was if you took an informed novice, someone who had the capacity to learn like all the, uh, you know, basically with maybe an undergraduate degree or maybe a high school diploma, you know, what, what if they acquired, if they had some basic skill level, what is the most efficient way to understand the contents of a certain field? So in this case, they're interested in teaching someone basically everything you would learn in an undergraduate physics course, but to do it in a self-motivated way or a self-educated way. And so uh, we've, you know, this is this is their answer. You you address these different issues. If you read the book, you'll see they have a couple of key things that they present, and it's supposed to give you everything you need to know to be somewhat. Uh, conversant in physics. Now, I work for an organization called Open, the Open Worm Foundation, and we've observed this very issue. Uh, we have people who come in with skills in like, you know, heavy computer science skills, maybe people who come in with mostly biological skills, and they need to contribute to this community, but they need to understand a little bit of both. And so they need to get up to speed in one area or another. And this is uh, one approach that we kind of used to do this. But there's got to be a better way to do this, a more systematic way. Um, and so that's kind of where we're going with the epistemological directories. Now, epistemological directories have their origins in Web 1.0. And so this is back in from like the late 90s, early 2000s. This is an example of a directory from that era. And so you have it, it was uh, put together by the Conrad, 
Conrad Lorenz Institute. And they had this uh, website where you would go and you could do, you know, learn all sorts of theoretical concepts in these different fields. So, you know, developmental biology, economics, cognitive science, you could click on one of these uh, buttons and, you know, it basically presented papers with annotations with some other information, but it's very static. And, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it was a predecessor to Wikipedia, but it did have this sort of, uh, you know, centered around a, uh, an academic field flavor to it. Um, so why don't I introduce one instance of one of these uh, uh, epistemological directories, and that is called the knowledge space. And so we've implemented the knowledge space in the area of cybernetics and systems. And so this is the GitHub repository here. And uh, you'll if you look at the full slides, I think you can actually click on it and go to the GitHub repository. So this is a GitHub repository, and it has a bunch of folders. These directories uh, are topical stubs. So if you may be able to see here, there are different topics, and there are different granularities. So you have like irreducibility, EGRT, general, interactivity. So there are all these things that, like, as we've come along uh, through this topical area, we've thought, OK, this is a good thing to put a stub in this directory for. And so you can see there are different granularities and they're different. They may be a little bit vague as to what the topics contain, but you click in through to that directory and you could read the readme file and uh, you can get a taste of what those are. Uh, version control encourages edits from the community and general public. So hosting it on GitHub, we can use version control to bring in people's contributions and then uh, the directories, edits, and content can all be proposed through pull requests. So it makes it uh, quite a bit uh, very democratic in that way. Uh, so the idealized structure, you know, we have when we go into one of these uh, folders or these directories, we can do things like render equations in a very nice manner using Markdown. We can also uh, incorporate things like Jupyter Notebooks and Colab Notebooks. So if you're doing machine learning or if you're doing like, you know, coding, uh, you want to include some code in your descriptions or your content, you can do that. And it's very easy to do in GitHub. Um, so the second instance is called a knowledge map. And a knowledge map is a little bit of a departure from the last instance I showed. These are graphical representations. And so these are timelines and historical summaries of key events. So this is why I talked about history a bit. And Knowledge maps can be used to summarize directories in a knowledge space. So we want to summarize things that happened. How did a field unfold and what are the key events? And then we'll talk about in the third instance, epistemological maps, and we'll get to that slide in a couple of slides. But this is a, going a little bit further in that graphical direction. So this is an example of a knowledge map. Uh, this is a machine learning knowledge map. It starts in the 1800s. And the granularity is a bit, you know, um, you know, most of the stuff happens in the last 70 years, but that's, you know, you can add different uh, categories, you can add different events, different people, and that's what makes it dynamic. Uh, but you can also uh, do something like this, have an, uh, in the field of artificial life, instead of uh, machine learning, and here you have a little bit different approach. This is where we have a lot of events, people, uh, experiments, software platforms, uh, things like that. And they're all kind of like, you know, they look very chaotic here, but you can, you know, uh, go to one of these events. And in this case, like Open Problems in Artificial Life, this was a, a, a published conference proceeding. So you have names here, you have a date, and then you can find out more about each of those events. So uh, one of the thing, a couple of the things about knowledge maps to keep in mind is that you have a number of milestones per duration of timeline. So depending on your pedagogical aim, you want to include different types of milestones and different amounts of milestones. So you saw with comparing the machine learning map and the artificial life map that the artificial life map was much more dense. And that's important if you're trying to teach, you know, maybe a lot more about the field or, you know, more intimate history or something like that. Uh, so a small number of milestones may take a minimal amount of information approach, uh, but the artificial life map might take a different approach, which is to sort of be inclusive in terms of the history. Um, 
And then milestones can stress common themes across learners. So learners can propose different miles or different uh, milestones or, or, or nodes into this uh, into these uh, timelines, and you know they can modify them as they need as they see fit, or as maybe someone who with some knowledge of the background of that field sees fit. Um, and you can stress obscure events, say, that build the foundation for later advances. So in the artificial life map. We had things like Core War and Theseus, which were software programs that weren't maybe very big at the time, but they led to advances later on. And so you'd want to include those in a map. Uh, so that those are those are knowledge maps. Now, epistemological maps, which is the third instance of this, takes us a little bit further. Uh, this is a, again a visualization, um, and this is a theoretical sort of sketch of it. And you have uh, two different categories basically of facts. Uh, one is what do we know? So the knowledge maps that I showed you are things that we know. Uh, this has, the, has to do with the history of the field, but these are things that we know happened in the history of the field. Well, what do we need to know is the other, or what, what we don't know is the other category. And so uh, this goes maybe a little bit beyond the history of the field, but it could be in the history of the field. We don't know maybe some of the history of the field. It may be pretty obscure unless you're a historian doing a lot of research on, on you know, topics like, in computing, we have people who made contributions and were forgotten about, and we'd like to bring them back into the fold. And so that's what these little bars are here under what do we need to know. So we can include events that were previously obscured or maybe things that we find through experiment or some other research mode. And so we can then uh, put, build a distribution of those facts. Uh, I talk about it very quantitatively, but you can do this in terms of a historiography uh, and you can build a better um, knowledge map or history of the field. And so this is all for education, um, educational purposes. But there are a couple of things we need to think about here. Uh, we need to think about top-down control and the emergence within a community. And I think, uh, we, you know, we talk about community standards. Uh, we want to enforce community standards, but we also want to allow people to uh, build a knowledge base over time. So we don't want to be too over, you know, heavy handed with community standards. We don't want to uh, use an admin to say, quash things that we don't think are important, but we also don't want people just to propose things that aren't really critical to the learning experience. And so we need to clarify what is significant. Um, and so finally, I get to the fourth instance, which is frontier maps. And this is something my co-author has been working on. This is an instance of his frontier map. And so this incorporates some of the elements of the, um, of the first instance. Uh, what he's done is he's re kind of reimagined this a bit and uh, he's built a broad taxonomy outside of traditional disciplines. So he uses these macro tags, techniques, discoveries, and ideas. And these, are, these serve as like directories here. And those are, you know, ways that you can like think about it in terms of like going from the general to the specific. So you go from ideas and discoveries to techniques, or you can use ideas and then techniques and you can jump to discoveries. It's, it's that sort of synergy that you can build into these maps. You know, you have different categories of thing and you can build from that. Um, but you also want to cover transdisciplinary topics. So, you know, you want to frame the map as a, as a learner that grows their educational resources. So uh, right now, Jesse has artificial intelligence and systems and ethics in his um, frontier map, but later that might transmute into different fields. So it's very constructivist in that way. Um, frontier maps should provide minimal information to be comp competent in a field. So we go from broad ideas and assumptions the methods and techniques to systems and then to theories. We can, you know, uh, we have this sort of staged complexity of discovery. You start at sort of the foundational aspects of a field and you build up to specifics. And then nodes can lead to other, other nodes. So you can sub-reference different uh, topics and you can, you know, kind of go down a rabbit hole, but in a controlled way. So in the future, Jesse would like to build visualizations of themes and individual nodes He'd like to incorporate more things, um, you know, Jupyter notebooks and tutorials and presentations, and then allow people to choose paths. Would you like to be an individual scholar or would you like to be heavily into the collaborative space? And so that's that's something that 
talks about, you know, uh, learner mode or learner style. And so the, that's all part of his vision for that. Um, finally, I think one of the applications uh, is that you can integrate this with, you know, digital courses, with course materials that are in your organization. So in our organization, we have courses that we host. This is one of them. This would be an example of putting these knowledge spaces into the course curriculum. Uh, I don't show a really clear example of that here, but you can imagine that we can use these to teach this topic in, in different various topics in this curriculum. And we can incorporate it with other technologies. So we use GitHub as the host for this, but we don't have to. Uh, conversely, we have all these other uh, forms of education in our uh, digital course uh, stack. So we have GitHub, but we also have Hypothesis, which allows you to make notes in web pages. We have Gitter, which is an interactive chat. We have micro badges that we use to, you know, uh, uh, impart, you know, very small scale lessons to students. And then we have YouTube, which allows us to stream video of topics. So all those things people are learning in our organization. Uh, and but we want to also have this sort of uh, these sort of epistemological directories. One it, as in terms of like basically a, uh, a reference. So you can go back and look at different topics and store things in your own topic uh directory and you know compare notes but also just to have these uh assets as part of these uh directories to say you know use youtube videos as a stub or use a hypothesis note as a stub and so those are all possibilities as well uh finally i would like to talk about uh how we envision sort of interdisciplinarity and so we think about this in a sort of a cybernetic model so we think about this in terms of like the evolution of these type, the, these epi uh, epistemological directories. Uh, so we facilitate new contributions from allied fields on a regular basis. So people with different skill sets and they want to learn about other areas that may be relevant to our organization. And in the process, they're making all these cross disciplinary discoveries. So they're making their own contributions based maybe on what they know or what they'd like to know. And then they identify key papers and historical milestones. And then there are other people who maybe have expertise in that area and they can verify whether that's important or not, or maybe that's a, a good thing to follow up on. And so this model of interdisciplinarity is based sort of on the practice of transdisciplinarity. So it's kind of like building this emerging community of you know transdisciplinary scholars. They're all kind of helping each other learn. They're all learning kind of at their own pace. And then you're building this resource uh, for future learners, and it's improving with each iteration. So the community builds a model of knowledge rather than simply consulting or borrowing from another field. And I say that uh, with the caveat of what we mentioned a couple slides back, which is that, you know, even if you have this community of people, uh, you know, it's just one community of people. There are other perspectives out there that might be, you know, uh, that might be able to give you more information. So they have their own biases, their own perspective, their own interests. It's, you know, we really want to be as inclusive as possible to make these really successful. I and know. so finally, I'll put in a plug for the data reuse initiative. Uh, and this is our initiative that we do with, uh, for data reuse and data sharing. So if you're interested in a bunch of topics in this area, you should check this out. And we're uh, accepting collaborators in our in our in this project and thank you very much thank you so much Bradley now it looks like there's one question um uh, is what kind of information is with what kind of innovations would further enable greater interactivity between users and curators uh, I think maybe building on to the github functionality so building on like you know things that are more effective at interaction between maybe learners or maybe like, you know, uh, moderators and learners, people with expertise, bringing them together. So, you know, we use GitHub and GitHub as a social component, but we really do need to have a more explicit sort of interactivity, you know, an interactive um, aspect to this. And it's that's what's missing among a couple other things, but I think that's the biggest thing. Cool. And another question is, 
this is interesting and parallels a lot of basic frameworks for archived libraries, especially with regards to transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary work. Have you thought about learning from or partnering with librarians, archivists who have similar goals? Uh, well, yeah, we're at an early stage in this, so we would definitely be interested in input from uh, archivists, librarians, and other people who have done uh, similar types of work. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking for people who uh, would like to collaborate, so. Cool. Um, thank you so much, Bradley, for this lovely presentation. Uh, are there any more questions from, from the studio audience? Looks like there's a lot of conversations about what software might be best and a lot of sharing of said software of different timeline type software. Yeah. Awesome. Well then, um, if there's no other question, I am, I'm sure um, Bradley and Jesse, you'll be around on Slack during the rest of CSV Conf and perhaps in the future as well. Um, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to drop them a line in the Q&A, in Slack Q&A. Uh, we're about one minute away from closing ceremonies, so feel free to hop over to the closing ceremonies URL and uh, and hopefully see everyone there. Thank you so Thank much. You.